Hello and welcome to the Circuit Python Weekly for February twenty February sixteenth, twenty twenty one. My name is Scott and I work on Circuit Python for Adafruit. Um, Circuit Python is a version of Python designed for tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, Adafruit is an open source hardware and software company based out of New York that funds development of Circuit Python. Uh, they do they sell hardware and Circuit Python runs on that hardware. So if you have uh, electronics projects you want to do, um, then take a look. Take a look at Adafruit.com uh, and also learn.adafruit.com. Uh, this meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join at any time by going to the URL adafru.it/discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Uh, this meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday, as it did yesterday. Uh, if the meeting time has changed, we'll notify you via uh, Discord. If you want to be notified about changes in the meeting, uh, have us add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. Uh, there is also a calendar that you can add uh, to your calendar uh, to see uh, when the meeting is as well. Uh, this meeting is recorded. We will record audio from the voice channel and video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, uh, you're still still welcome to participate. And we've covered that how to do that pri previously by adding to the note stock. Uh, the video video of this meeting will be posted on the Adafruit YouTube, to, and the audio is released as a podcast. Uh, if you find this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, let us know. Um, there is a note stock to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate but can't make it to the meeting, you can leave hug reports and status updates for us in the document. We'll read them off during the meeting. Uh, the notes document also contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you the most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so that gives you the option to skip around. A link to the notes document is posted in the CircuitPython channel on the Adafruit Discord every week. Uh, check the pinned messages to find the latest. All right, so this meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news. Uh, this is where we talk about all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware. Um, it is usually a preview of the Python and microcontrollers newsletter, but because today is Tuesday, the newsletter actually just went out this morning, so it's not quite a preview. Uh, the second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is like a statistics overview of the entire project, gives you gives us some grounding in some numbers. The third part is hug reports. It's a chance to say uh, thank you to the folks that have been doing awesome things within our community. Fourth is status updates. Uh, status op updates is an opportunity to sync up with what we've been working on and uh, can also coordinate, collaborate, and do tips or tricks for folks what they're doing. Last up is in the weeds. It's an opportunity for more long form discussion. Uh, any sorts of discussions, they can be community related, they can be CircuitPython related uh, and usually are. Um, and they can either come out of status updates or something that folks have uh, added to the agenda um, prior to that in, in, the, uh, <laughs> in the previous week. Uh, so that's how everything goes. And uh, let's... I'll get started with community news after I take a time code here. So first up, um, Visual Studio Code comes to the Raspberry Pi. So this says uh, Visual Studio Code officially comes to Raspberry Pi, as well as supporting Debian Linux on X64. There are now builds for ARM and ARM64, both of which can run on the Raspberry Pi OS. The ARM ARM build on the Raspberry Pi OS, the ARM64 on the beta of the 64-bit Raspberry Pi OS. And check the Raspberry Pi blog there, and there's a link in the in the channel there for those who are in the meeting. Next up, uh, Focus, MIDI, digital music. With MIDI baked into CircuitPython, getting new boards like the Raspberry Pi Pico using this music standard is straightforward. Below are some projects using MIDI posted on the internet this week. One is a drum machine with the Raspberry Pi Pico. This is a USB MIDI 16 channel step sequencer for Raspberry Pi Pico right, written in CircuitPython v6.2. Um, Twitter link and the code is on GitHub. Uh, furthermore, a MIDI controller using Raspberry Pi Pico with a Pimeroni RGB keypad and Adafruit CircuitPython. Thanks to Sandy McDonald for the code in the iPad Pro. Uh, receiving MIDI on the forthcoming RP2040 powered Tiny 2040 from Pimeroni. Uh, Mini notes over USB make the LED light red, uh, 
but you could hook up a whole chain of NeoPixels and have them blink in time to your music, or have solenoids to hit a real drum, you name it, programmed in CircuitPython. Uh, and lastly, MIDI in for 3.3 volt microcontrollers using Raspberry Pi Pico or Circuit Playground Express and CircuitPython and MicroPython. And ne the next focus we have here for projects that folks are doing is HID keyboards. So uh, using CircuitPython boards for the USB HID human interface device uh, standards, such as keyboards and mice, has been appealing to new Raspberry Pi Pico project builders. Keyboards, software control, and mouse control are all possible with the USB HID. Here are some projects using HID this past week. Uh, the Pico producer, uh, a Raspberry Pi Pico based 12 key HID keyboard, uh, kind of like a stream deck. Uh, the Pico producer is an OBS control, con OBS controller, OBS being the open broadcaster software. I think that's what it is. Uh, using a Raspberry Pi Pico, a 3D printed case, and CircuitPython. Uh, and that's it. So this, the CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. Uh, if you want to contribute, uh, please go to the... Uh, we have a GitHub repo for it. It's github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython dash weekly dash newsletter and check the drafts folder there. Uh, please submit a pull request with uh, anything you want on there. Or if you're on Twitter, you can ta tag at an engineer on Twitter. Uh, that is at A-N-N-E underscore engineer on Twitter or email an underscore B at adafruit.com uh, with all your latest tips for... Uh, cool Python on hardware stories of the week. And with that, let's go to the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. So uh, this is a section that where we talk uh, about uh, like the statistics of the health of the project. It's a way to ground us in how things are going. Um, so overall, sorry, I'm taking time codes. Uh, we had 54 pull requests merged from 23 different authors. Uh, some new names I don't, uh, don't recognize on here is Tice Tr Tramstra, K. Tebow, J. Agrigger Park. Uh, <laughs> is the French one that was there last week. Uh, SAC 917, IoT 49, uh, J.F. Abernathy, Max Beck, Sandy McDonald, j for c and Wildest Pixel are all new to me. So thank you to all 23 authors. We also had 20, or not 23, 11 reviewers, which is uh, also excellent. Uh, as always, if you want to help us out, reviewing is, is super helpful because the more reviewers we have, the more authors we can support. Um, so if you want to level up from author, say, to reviewer, let us know and we'd, we'd love to help you do that. Um, issues wise, we had 38 closed issues by 17 people and 15 opened by 13 people. So we're net down, uh, by th what, 13, 18, no math, 23 math is hard. Um, so that's awesome. Okay. Let's move on to the core. Can you tell I had a long weekend? <laughs> um, okay, so for the core, we had four pull requests merged from four different authors. Thank you to those authors. We had four reviewers as well. And Anecdata is a new reviewer on here. So thank you to Anecdata for reviewing for the core. Um, we have 18 open pull requests where a number of those are creeping up in age. So we need to take a look at those. Uh, but generally, 18 is not too bad. Uh, we had eight closed issues by five people and four open by three people. So we're net down four as well. Uh, for a total of 395 open issues. Now, this number is growing uh, slightly over time. Um, and the way that we keep track of like whether we're staying on top of the, the issues or not is by tracking or triaging and mark marking milestones. So we have four issues not assigned a milestone. Those are ones we need to take a look at. Uh, we've got seven open support issues, which we, we should probably look at as well. They don't tend to need to stay open very long because those are like questions and stuff, not necessarily things that we need to fix or implement. Um, and 
we have 315 open issues marked long term. So those are the things that uh, we'd like to get to at some point, but have no immediate plans to. Um, so that's where we are in the core. Um, overall, we've been keeping an almost one beta a week pace, thanks to Dan, um, who's been doing those releases and getting lots of new stuff out, particularly for the Raspberry Pi Pico. So um, thank you to everybody for working on that. Uh, I think the plan is to kind of stay in the beta phase for a bit uh, while we stabilize and add stuff for the Pico. Um, at some point, we'll also, well, some, t some point soon, we'll have other boards with the RP2040 as well. And so that's something that we're, we're very aware of as well. Um, so that's it for the core. Uh, let's me kick it over to Katni for the overview or the stats for the libraries. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. So this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries. So everything that begins with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras such as Cookie Cutter and the Community Bundle. Um, so we had 46 pull requests merged, which is a pretty high number, but um, I know we had a few of the um, CI updates still in the works and those were merged, so that was good. But uh, with 18 authors, there were definitely a number of non-CI related PRs, which is excellent, and 11 reviewers. Uh, in terms of merged pull requests, the oldest one was 166 days old, and I'm really excited to see this one. We updated our library cookie cutter. It's now possible to have a more community bundle friendly cookie cutter library, depending on how you answer the questions. So that was really great to see. And um, early hug report to Foamy Guy for updating the guide to go with uh, the sharing a library guide. Um, the cookie cutter section was updated to match it. Uh, let's see. So that leaves us with, wait for it, 53 open pull requests. Uh, we had 26 closed issues by 13 people and 11 open by 10 people. So we're net down, which is excellent, leaving us with 280 open issues. Seven of those are labeled good first issues. Uh, if you're interesting, interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side, uh, consider going to circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including a list of open pull requests, a list of open issues, and some library infrastructure issues. Um, you can search the open issues. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. Uh, and there is a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. So if that's something you're new to, um, don't let that intimidate you. The guide is there to help, and so are we. We're available on Discord all the time um, to answer questions. And we had one new library this week. Um, and then the list of updated libraries was many pages long. Um, so I removed it from the notes. Uh, that's because we're still doing the releases on the um, latest library sweep um, of CI update stuff that we did. So that's why it was so huge. Uh, and that's where we are with the libraries. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. OK, next up we have uh, Blink is Stats from Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, so for Blinka, which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers, this week we had four pull requests merged by three authors and two reviewers. Uh, there were there are three open pull requests left, and there were four closed issues by four people and zero open by zero, leaving a net of 50 open issues. There were 1,929 PyPI downloads in the last week, and we are currently supporting 67 boards. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance for us to say thank you to folks for what they've been doing within our sphere of CircuitPython and Python and all of those things. Um, so I will start and then we'll go through the list of folks, uh, both in the notes and then the folks who are in the voice chat as well. And we covered details of that prior to the meeting. Uh, so first up, um, first a hug report for me to Sanity McDonald for Pimeroni examples of CircuitPython. Uh, Hug Reports asked Patrick W. for the ESP IDF update work. Uh, Hug Report to H. Waguna for bug filing and asking really uh, good questions on Discord. 
And lastly, uh, hug report to Starwitch for the ESP bug file uh, that Hierofact fixed. Thank you, Hierofact. Uh, but Starwitch also followed up with a huge thank you, which was always nice to get appreciation on, on being responsive. So uh, that's it for me. Uh, let's go to TG Techie. Just a community hug. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up is... Ask Patrick W, who's who's not here, so I'll I'll read that off. Uh, Patrick says thanks to Foamy Guy, Catney, and Summersoft for their support, patience, testing, and code review on the Circuit Python Library Cookie Cutter PR, which makes it more flexible for community and Adafruit bundle libraries. Thanks to Jepler for adding the requirements.txt data to the library bundles as well. And next up, I have notes from C Grover who says, group hug for the team and community. Amazing progress uh, for the RP2040. And next is Charles. Hello. I have just a group hug, but uh, I just wanted to make one comment. There, uh, in listening to this, I, in listening to this, this uh, group, uh, I found a lot of good information, especially on the RP2040. And I thank you very much for that. Awesome. Thank That's you. it. Thanks, Charles. All right, next up is Dan. Hello. Hello. So just two things I can, that I can remember off the bat of looking at pull requests. One is Dave Putz. Thank you for fixing an RP2040 PWM out bug, which just, it was, there was some logic error there. And thanks to Southern Dragon in Discord, who found that an existing um, BLE example having to do with Adafruit services and the Circuit Playground Bluefruit app doesn't work anymore as of Circuit Python 6.1 or so. So I'm trying to track that down right now. OK. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. All right, Dave P is looking. And I've got notes from David. Glad who says, uh, Hug reports Dan H for helping with the unreleased LYWS D03 MMC thermometer, <laughs> thermometer library, and now it is released. Uh, Hug reports Wildest Pixel that demonstrated and sharing code for using the Pico Explorer from Pimaroni with CircuitPython. Hug report to Lamour for adding two independent pins, uh, not SDA or SEL, to the STEM QT connector of the RP2040 QtPy. And uh, hug report to Philip for fighting the self-promoted Lego cops in Maker forums. <laughs> uh, next up is Deshipu. Right. So, uh, so thanks to Dan for reviewing and merging my pull requests. Uh, thank you to Scott for uh, giving me advice on how to uh, write those things. And uh, thanks to, oh my God, I can't remember the, like, uh, the, the fancy bitmap uh, pull request that looks uh, really useful. So that's uh, kmatch98. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. All right, next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, mm -hmm. This week I got um, hug report for Jose David M for making a baseline alignment enhancement inside the display text labels that allows us to line up different uh, fonts along the baseline, which is really nice. Um, also for working through all the changes in that PR, uh, Jose has been sticking with it. I really appreciate that. Um, to Kmatch, uh, same thing. The shipper just mentioned the, that fancy bitmap is, is really really cool. Uh, being able to rotate and scale uh, bitmaps is really nice. Also, Kmatch did. A bunch of good work looking over some of my pull uh, requests this week, the wrap text by pixels one and pointed out a bunch of issues to fix in there. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Ask Patrick W and Summersoft both uh, for getting work done in the cookie cutter library that makes it easier to build community bundle, community bundle projects. Um, to Hugo for uh, working on the um, progress bar. He broke it up into a package so that we can have different ones and they will extend a base class um, and then Hugo has also worked on the vertical progress bar, uh, which is really cool. And then uh, lastly, I'll just mention a, a group hug, and I hope uh, everybody is uh, staying warm. I know there's 
very cold throughout most of the US and some people are losing power and stuff. So I hope everybody is uh, keeping warm. That's it for me. Thanks. Thanks, Phoebe guy. All right, next up is Hierophant. Okay. Um, thanks this week to uh, Jeff Epler and Dan for their reviews on the Ice Squared C repeated start PR. Um, thanks, Dan, for his help uh, uh, talking about bugs uh, in Ice Squared C this morning, just just now. Appreciate it. Um, thanks to uh, Anik Data, Naradoc, Bruce Siegel, and Thomas at BTTF and a number of other people for their help in testing the I2C and SPI issues, which have been present on the ESP32 S2. Um, and uh, thanks again to uh, Bruce again and uh, ask Patrick W and MicroDev uh, for their work on updating the ESP32 IDF to version 4.3. And uh, then a group hug. Thanks, Hire Effect. All right, next up is Hugo. Do you want to try your mic, or should I read you, read it off for you? I know you're kind of lurking. <laughs> Hugo is typing. Now can you hear me? You're a bit quiet, but I can hear you. OK. I'm still getting Discord set up on this computer, so sorry about that. It's all good. So first off, a uh, hug for KMAX98 and Foamy Guy for all the help, feedback, and information they've given me while I'm working on that progress bar library. Uh, to stir for use the patience in, ask, in answering some of my more newbie-like questions while he was putting together a board. Um, to Foamy Guy for streaming on Saturday and the others who were there where I picked up a bunch of good information and then do a pedal around for just making this community as wonderful as it is. Awesome. Thank you, Hugo. All right. Jason's lurking. So next up is Jeff. There's the unmute button. You All found right. it. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, going, uh, this isn't quite alphabetically, but uh, I want to thank uh, Patrick for even more upcoming improvements to Circup's dependency management and Brent for Adafruit date time, which I used uh, over the weekend or maybe on Monday, and it worked like a charm. Uh, thanks to Lady Ada for keeping the interesting project assignments coming. Uh, to Scott for taking over the meeting today for me. To Paint Your Dragon, I may have done this one last week, for doing the heavy lifting for RGB matrix on the RP2040, including the Pico. Um, and to Harry, who is HWaguna on GitHub, He's a friend who has become a big CircuitPython advocate in our local maker community. He loves his Pico. He loves CircuitPython on it. I think every virtual meeting for a month, he's going to show how there's this CircuitPy drive, and you just edit the file on it because that's amazing. And it's <laughs> so fun to see his excitement. Um, anyway, and then finally to Hire Effect for taking a stab at this I2C Wi-Fi ESP32S2 issue that several of us had try have tried to resolve. I know one of these times we will figure out what we're doing wrong or figure out where the ESP IDF bug is, but uh, thanks for taking your turn. And that's what I got. <laughs> thanks, Jeff. All right, next up is Jerry. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, just a thanks to Admiral Maggie for putting in a PR to add some enhancements and fixes to the fingerprint library, fingerprint sensor library. Nice job. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, mm -hmm. is Johnny lurking? Johnny, are you lurking? I assume you are. I think Johnny's lurking. I think, I think I saw that earlier. Next up, we had notes from Jose, which I'll read off. Uh, I, I think you said it earlier, Johnny. It just, I missed it. Johnny said, sorry, lurking. Um, okay, so notes from Jose. Jose says, hug report to Foamy Guy for the live streams and all the explanations and allowing me to contribute. Uh, and hug report to Hugo, Kmatch98, J for CN, Ask Patrick W, and Naradoc for the community coding session. It's a lot of fun. And next up is Katni. I just scrolled away from things. Hold on a second. <laughs> I feel ya. Trying to update the trying to update the notes. Okay. So I have a hug report for Foamy Guy for picking up a bunch of PRs over the last week. Um RIP my inbox, but it's excellent to come back and archive 90% of what's in there because it's all been merged. 
um, Hug Report to ask Patrick W. and Foamy Guy for getting the updated cookie cutter PR going, um, as well as uh, to Summersoft, who popped in. Uh, the PR was originally put in by um, by Summersoft um, and then got uh, dropped for a bit. And so um, in the final stages of that, uh, Summersoft also showed up to uh, help out. So that was excellent. And another Hugger Porch Foamy Guy for updating the cookie cutter part of the sharing a library in CircuitPython guide. Um, that was uh, one of the concerns I had was that we have very explicit instructions in that guide to go with cookie cutter and we were breaking those instructions entirely. Um, and so that all got taken care of all at the same time. And that was very excellent. And that's what I've got. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. All right, next up we have notes from Kevin Thomas, who says, Hugger Report to Foamy Guy for helping with the Adafruit Display SSID 1306 library. And next is KMatch98. Hey, thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, first, reiterate what Foamy Guy said. Uh, thanks to Jose for finalizing the display text label with the new baseline. Uh, definitely makes life a heck of a lot easier for typesetting. So that'll be a, that's a great contribution. Uh, also, Foamy Guy, thanks for the inspiration to use Blinka for debugging uh, and also finding some peculiar differences to look out for. So thanks for that. Uh, also, thanks, Hugo, for contributing on the progress bar. Um, and Deshapu for introducing me to some of the lingo for some of the demo scene of graphics, uh, particularly, uh, in this case, uh, the RotoZoom lingo. So a lot of, a lot of words that, uh, to, to learn from, from uh, what people have done before. Uh, and then next, uh, thanks, Jeff, for the PCF font edition. Uh, five times faster to find glyphs using that. And so every day I get minutes of my life back, thanks to you. <laughs> and uh, last of all, warm hugs to everybody. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Kmatch. All right, uh, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello, I wanted to give a hug to Anik Data for helping out with when I was having trouble with the ESP Home. Uh, on the ESP32 S2. Uh, hug to Foamy Guy and ask Patrick W for all your GitHub contributions and to group hug to everyone else. And that's Th it. Thanks, Melissa. Mm -hmm. All right, now I've got notes from Mark Gambler who says group hug. And I've got notes from Mr. Certainly who says a hug report to Katni for helpful conversations regarding ongoing projects and a group hug. Thanks for making this an awesome place. And lastly, we have Microdev. Are you text only? Or, okay. I'll read off from Microdev, who says, uh, hug report to uh, Bruce and ask Patrick W for the ESP IDF update testing. And that's it for hug reports. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next up, we have status updates, uh, which is a chance for us to talk about what we've been working on and what we plan on working on in the coming week. It's really helpful uh, if folks are working on similar things or somebody's working on something that somebody has previously worked on to give tips or tricks. Uh, that's what we, we're going for with status updates. It's also a great way to just see all the different things that are going on within the sphere of CircuitPython, Blinka, and the libraries. Uh, so I'm scrolling down, and I'll, I will start... Um, I, it's a short week for me. Uh, Monday yesterday was a holiday. It really, it's going to feel like Monday today because it's going to be very similar. And uh, skiing Friday morning. So uh, that means that my stream will actually be on Thursday. Even though I said last week it would be on Friday, we changed our minds based on the weather, how the weather is looking this week. Um, so today is catching up with email and such. Uh, and then I'm going to try my darndest to wrap up with the I2S and the PIO PR or what I was doing I squared S, which is an audio protocol. And then I'm using PIO under the hood. So I've been expanding and elaborating the PIO support, which is something I wanted to do. Probably shouldn't have lumped it together with the I2S stuff, but now that we're starting to see people use it, there's things that we're finding that we need to do. So I'll probably add all of the, the initialization stuff today after I, or tomorrow once I, figure out my issues now so hoping beyond hope to have uh audio bus io done by the end of the week uh so that i can move on to whatever i feel is most urgent uh after that so yep hopefully hopefully more of that okay uh let's go on to tg techie 
Hi, everyone. Um, so last week was a lot of work on the smart-ish watch I've been building. <laughs> um, with a friend of mine, I found, well, we, I should say, found a bug uh, and patched it with a single diode. Now it no longer uh, falls into a brownout safety handler when it uh, hits low battery. Um, and that leaves only one known issue, uh, one known issue with it, which is Bluetooth, which still isn't working. Um, although I've made a little progress in debugging that. Um, and lastly, last week I started uh, for, for my job, actually, this is non-Python news, but making a C code formatter for the makerspace at my college. Um, it's supposed to be a little bit like black, the code formatter, but for C. Uh, after trying and using black in my personal Python project, I was like, this is great. I want this for C to make it simpler and easier. Um, and they said, go for it. So I've been working on that. Um, have you have you looked at like A style or Clang format? I've not heard of A style. I've looked at Clang format. Um, Neither of them are like black um, where you don't configure it, but they are both C formatters. Um, I'll take a look at A style. Um, I couldn't find any format files or people who had successfully said it could be done uh, for the style the makerspace wants. Mm. Um, and I'm, I think I want to dive into making things from scratch when I shouldn't. I am too. So that being, <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. I think it comes with the territory. Yeah. Um, yeah. A style is what MicroPython switched to. That's why it's on my radar. Otherwise, I would use Clang format. Clang format, <laughs> I think, is largely what people use. I think they're using Uncrustify, actually. Like they switched mm. from A style to Uncrustify. Okay. Uncrustify? Or maybe, I think it's Uncrustify. Right. But there, there are multiple issues in PRs about it. Right. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Looks like it does everything. Um, I'll take a look at those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next week, I'm going to try to do some more Bluetooth debugging for the watch. Swap out uh, the module with one on a feather to see if the issue is the watch board I designed or the Bluetooth modules I purchased. Um, or most likely, it'll be me. Though. And I'm programming it wrong. I want to uh, pull some fixes from upstream libs into the frozen libraries for CircuitPython since they're as from what I've seen, there are a couple errors that have creeped their way into the um, standard libs. And try to play with um, a suggestion on a simple rect PR I made a while ago uh, that um, Scott Tanut made and see how efficient or possible it is to merge the two together, have a RAM efficient or possibly outlined rect. It should be doable, but I want to double check. And that, that's all. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, TG Jackie. Uh, all right. Uh, circling around, uh, I've got notes from Ask Patrick W, who says, uh, circ up enhancement to pull requirements from the new requirements data bundle instead of fetching them from GitHub. And look into the Azure IoT C Python so sockets compatibility now that mini MQTT support sockets. This will bring Azure IoT to the ESP32 S2 ports. And next up is Dan. OK. Uh, so uh, last, I can't remember which night, I released uh, CircuitPython 6.2.0 beta.2. And it's amazing how many, there were only 10 days, I think, between beta 1 and beta 2, but they were like, as usual, like, several dozen PRs there. It, it takes longer to do these betas because there are so many things going in, which is great. Yep. Um, another minor thing I did is that um, we were sort of trying to finish off the native Adafruit SPI device um, support, which was, re was put in, removed, and then put back. And there was one more uh, dangling thread there, which is that the Adafruit SD card library, which is a Python 
support for SD cards was using something. It was sort of going into SPI device, and and so I fixed it so it doesn't do that anymore. And um, now, and then we were able to undo making that uh, property available in the native library. So we're it's all it's all set now. And then finally, I released the longest part name member LYWSD03 MMC library, and uh, which is uh, from Xiaomi Mijiji, uh, Chinese uh, large Chinese company, and it's a Bluetooth. Um, hygrometer and temperature thing, which is very cheap. It's in the store in Adafruit, but we haven't gotten stock yet, so it's coming soon. But you can get it elsewhere also. And then finally, I've been working on a secondary, this this idea of a secondary USB channel, a serial channel that doesn't interfere with the REPL, and I have it sort of half working right now. I'm adding some more features with it and trying to debug why it will receive characters, but when I write to it, I don't see the characters come out. Okay. Sounds That's it. sounds like progress, Dan. It is progress, yeah. Awesome. I think I, I think we underestimated how much people are gonna like that. I think it's gonna be really cool. I Lamore is very interested in it. She has all kinds of I think she has a backlog of products that she wants to do. Yeah. yeah. Of, of libraries and stuff. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Warrior Wire says that will be amazing too. Okay, uh, let me read notes from David Glad, who says, uh, testing various firmware on the LYWS D03 MMC thermometer. I have eight of them, five, st five stock, two ATC 1441s, and one PVVX, which are, I don't know what those variants are. I uh, connected a Pico to a mini Pi TFT, which is 22... 240 by 240 using the Pimeroni Pico Explorer pinout so that I can try the CircuitPython code from Wildest Pixel. I uh, tested CircuitPython development with limited internet connectivity. Uh, the size of the US2 file. Do we have documentation you can download once and read offline? How do you program without doing GitHub or Google search? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, learn guides you can get PDFs for. I do know that. Uh, non Python lost internet connectivity from Saturday morning until three hours ago, including two days of teleworking with a phone doing 4G LTE tethering, which implies no Netflix, no YouTube, no IoT device, no online gaming. Um, and next up is Deshipu. Yes, I, I finished. Uh, I, I'm focusing on a bit uh, more on games for CircuitPython recently. I finished, uh, actually ported the Tetris I have written a long time ago uh, for the uh, Hello Inc. Now I ported it to Pew Pew M4 and the PyGamer and PyBatch uh, devices. And uh, now it's a proper Tetris, so the lines get deleted and, and get a score and so on. So, uh, and it's only like 140 lines of code, so it should be easy for people to adapt to their own devices. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm now now I'm trying to make a game with an isometric view where you walk around, and uh, I will have a, an in the weeds question for for this. And uh, I also started to to try to write that library for. I think uh, controls uh, independent of the device uh, for the game. And uh, I, I don't really like the way it came out. So I'm going to work on that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. well, that's it. Awesome. Thanks to Shippen. All right. Next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, last week, I reviewed the uh, PR for the cookie cutter. Um, and tested that out a bunch. I use that on some of my own libraries, um, and I made the updates in the guide for that to go along with the new prompts. Um, I fixed a few issues that were found in the uh, pixel wrapping function that is uh, going to go inside of display text. Um, I tested and reviewed a, a PR that fixed um, a scale issue that we found inside of display text, where uh, it caused things to get uh, extra scaled, uh, like uh, two times as big as uh, they should be on, on Blinka. Um, and I, I beat my head against that one for a while and never did come up with a fix. Um, and somebody 
figured that out last week. It was, um, I, I practiced the name. It's Le, Le Samurai Porpe. I think it's uh, Purple Samurai, maybe. So shout out to them. Thanks again for that fix. That was really cool to see. Um, uh, for this week, I want to uh, give a final look over to the, the base alignment PR, which is in display text as well, and probably get that merged, uh, unless uh, anybody has any objections to that. So um, uh, anybody who is interested can check that out. Um, I want to uh, continue working on refactoring my, uh, what is now going to be a GUI layout uh, inflator library. So previously, I, I had built this library that inflates uh, some JSON layouts for you into display objects. And I also had included some layouts in there that would that would do some of the stuff that's now kind of in the, uh, the actual display layout library. So I'm splitting that up. I'm kind of focusing mine just on inflating. Um, and eventually, those layouts will move over into the real library. Uh, so I'll be working on that this week. And then lastly, um, I want to test out the, uh, the vertical progress bar specifically. And uh, also, there's a new uh, matrix portal example that is in that same PR that I want to try out this week. Uh, and that's what I got. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Filmy Guy. All right, next up is Hierofact. All righty. Last week, uh, I finished up uh, the I2C repeated start bug, um, putting in all the, the um, kind of uh, IRQ uh, infrastructure and stuff that was needed for that. That's um, on STM, right? Yes, on STM, yeah. So that's that should be all done. Um, it's working well. Uh, I hacked at the ESP32-S2 uh, I2C squared and Wi-Fi bugs, which I went in hoping, oh, let's just see if we can like fix a macro or something. And no, uh, they're they're weird. Um, there's like two different directions that we could go with them. And uh, they're very hard to pin down with a debugger because they disappear when you step through the code. Uh, and they may be related to heap resets or I, I interrupts or something. I don't know. They're they're weird. So um, I'm thinking I'm gonna probably put that down until we update the IDF again because it would really especially suck if I solved it and then it broke again once uh, we get the new version of the IDF in. So, um, but yeah, uh, I think we have at least got some good testing data and there's a lot of different people working on it in parallel. So I, I'm confident that we'll make progress uh, as we go on. Um, I fixed some minor, just little itty bitty PRs here and there. And uh, I read through a bunch of the existing low power code across the different ports uh, in preparation for what I'm doing this week, which is going to be getting started wholesale on STM32 Deep Sleep. Um, and as I mentioned, kind of just monitoring the IDF update, which just needs to kind of be coordinated. A lot of people, separate people, have different work on their own PRs. So we just need to get all that stuff together and then retest uh, once that's in. And uh, that's all I have planned for right now. But God, I can take on anything else. Um, but that's it for me. I, th I think a, I think a week focused on deep sleep is, is well earned at this point. All righty. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. All right, next up is Hugo. I might have to read it off. All right, I'll, I'll read off for Hugo unless Hugo interrupts me. Oh, sorry, I muted. I, I learned, but I did not. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, so last week I did finish the progress bar refactor, but it is very rough and um, has some visual quirks. So um, I just need to port some of the code I'd originally written to fix that up. Um, so that's going to be this week. And then also dug into using uh, PyLint with um, pre-commit instead of separate because I burned several uh, builds on GitHub just due to PyLint issues. All right. Did you, did you talk about this week, Hugo? Oh, I kind of did in passing, but yeah, this week is um, progress bar, the basics for the horizontal vertical, um, especially since Foamy Guy intends to uh, do some testing on that. Um, and then just kind of clean up what's there, the sample that I've sampled, I've added, um, and then some of the other features in uh, the other issues I've opened for 
just different quality of life improvement. Okay, awesome. Thank you, thank you. All right, next up is Jeff. Hello again. Um, I was typing this, but I'll say it aloud to Hugo. Don't worry about the CI failures on your pull request. Those are there to help all of us. I mean, it's great when we can do it locally. I think it would be a good step to take. But don't beat yourself up. Um, just when the automated system gives you a red X, it's uh, it's there to help you and it's there to help all of us. And mm -hmm. don't let it get you down. And I say that as somebody who lets it get him down. No, uh, I understand. It's, just, <laughs> it's you know, it's a two minute cycle. Oh wait, yeah. something else go fix. That's right. Cool. Yeah. The the benefit of making it faster is what counts. It's not the the computer gave me a red X. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, anyway, so I'll kick this off with my other stuff. Uh, my state has been affected by what are control called controlled outage areas. That's uh, rolling blackouts to you all due to a severe winter storm, uh, reducing electrical supply and increasing demand. So I was worried I wouldn't make the meeting, but uh, it's been fine and we are fine and safe and warm. So no worries there. Uh, anyway, as to CircuitPython work, uh, last week I worked on Protomatter for the RP2040 and it was working fine for me, but when Lamore tested it, she ran into problems, particularly when copying files uh, over USB. So I will investigate that further. Uh, in PIO, uh, I eventually got over some uh, humps that I had in my understanding of the PIO peripheral of the RP2040 and implemented first uh, a spy peripheral in PIO. And that meant enabling uh, reading from the PIO peripheral. Scott has this in his I2S uh, branch that he mentioned, and I think we're going to take his version instead. And I did find one bug uh, that affected inputs only that he's also incorporated that fix. Uh, for my own project, I love timekeeping, and there is a radio broadcast time signal in North America called WWVB. And I have a receiver now that works in CircuitPython. It can receive and decode the signal, then convert it to local time and show it. And that's where I was working with date time. Uh, let's see. I figured out how to read the RP2040's boot cell pin from C code uh, while you know your code is running. To do it in CircuitPython, it requires a modification of the core. It feels pretty hacky. Uh, so I'm just inviting a comment from Scott or from anybody else who has an opinion. Do we want to polish this and add it to CircuitPython, or is it best to just leave it alone because it's kind of yucky? No. Um, no. All right. <laughs> People should not be pressing boot cell unless they want to select what to boot. All right. Um, let's see. I worked on a document on how to participate in the CircuitPython meeting. We haven't really circulated that yet. Uh, it does change a little bit how we work with lurkers. So it'll finally take the onus off of lurkers to, to state their lurking status. And instead, we will look at the um, note stock as kind of the canonical. If you're going to speak, you put your name in there. Um, and I think it's going to speed up the meeting because when the notes takers like me miss that somebody said they were lurking, uh, it creates a little detour in the meeting. So that's the main change, but also we, we will have a document uh, for people who want to review how better to participate. Um, let's see. And then finally, I added the requirements.txt files to the Adafruit and community bundles. So in the future, as Patrick W has volunteered to use this in CircUp to install the dependencies of each library. CircUp does understand the dependencies now, but it uh, has to request the information from GitHub, and that's subject to API rate limits. So like hypothetically, if you want to do uh, CircUp 100 different boards within an hour, GitHub might have gotten across with you now, or once this change is made, it won't be a problem. It will probably also be faster. Uh, anyway, this week, at least some of the following, uh, I've made a second CircuitPython sculpture. It's physically complete. The thing to do next is make a short video about it. Next, protomatter for the RP2040. Like I mentioned, uh, there are these crashes under certain use cases, and I need to debug those. And while I'm in there, I plan to debug the failure of storage.erase file system on the RP2040. And finally, and the thing I've actually been working on the past two days is more with the PIO peripheral. Uh, I've got a PIO program that can drive eight NeoPixel strips in parallel using only three digital I.O. pins. Uh, so the main advantage of this is potentially a faster refresh, although it also takes time to reformat the data. And I'm looking at needing to add a core extension to do this. Basically, you have to rearrange it. So instead of taking the bits of the first pixel and then the bits of the second pixel, 
you have to take the first bit of the first pixel and then the first bit of the eighth pixel and then the first bit of the 24th pixel or something crazy like that. And it would, it's really slow to do this in CircuitPython. It can be really fast to do it uh, in C where you have fast bit manipulations. So for this to really be viable, we will need to put a function to do that in the core. Uh, but man, it is really neat to be able to drive eight independent NeoPixel strips and they update so fast. Uh, it's wonderful. Anyway, that's what I've uh, been up to and what I'm going to be up to. Thank you. So for the proto matter thing, just I think we turn when we erase, we're supposed to turn off interrupts. Uh, but just it's weird on the RP twenty forty and the IMX has this too, and the and the ESP has this as well. It's like remember that running code can do flash accesses, right? So if if you're in a state like where we're we think we're modifying the flash, you know, because of the drive stuff and we get an interrupt that is trying to run off of that. Like you're going to have a bad time. Uh, so I think we have it off, but like, that's, that's where my brain goes when I hear something like that. All right. I will investigate that. All right. Next up is Jerry. Uh, hi. Um, so I always find it hard to resist when somebody in, a, in the forum has a question about the RFMs, <laughs> and uh, so I always like playing with them. So spent a lot of much time helping somebody get a, a, an RFM 9x project working. It was kind of fun. I learned a lot. And then um, somebody else had an issue. They posted it actually into the RFM 9x library as an issue. Not sure it really is an issue there, but it's a good place to track this. They were getting some interference or thought so when they were using the RFM with the GPS. But the, I don't think there's any real issue there. But the cool thing was that this would not have been possible before we we built the new RFM 9x board, you know, with the built-in libraries. Uh, and there's a cat. Um, and um, so it was really actually I, I was really really having fun seeing just how much could be fit into that code. Um, something that I really never even thought about being able to do on an RFM on an Feather M0 RFM board. And then uh, another user. Um, is or actually that same user uh, is having is also trying to use an M0 blue fruit blue blue fruit with the RFM 9x. There it's a little different because nothing's built in and it's tight memory. But uh, just playing with it now and and try you know the new um, new ver new circuit Python and all the memory is getting better. So it looks like it might it might be usable. A, lot, a bunch of testing to do, but it's been been a fun project to play with, and it's re you know, reminded me a lot of stuff about blue fruit and I'll bring that up in the weeds later. Um, and so my next week is to keep poking around with that RFM 9X and blue fruit stuff. And then for fun, um, I came across the guides that said how to set up an RPI four as a, as a home assistant and the guides, there are a bunch of guides on it and they're, they're really nice. Um, and one of the really cool features was that you can read and write NFC tags. I have a bunch of NFC tags and uh, you can program them from the home assistant and then use them to trigger events. So it's actually kind of a, a cool tool, learning lots of things about the home assistant and, uh, and, and triggering stuff. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. Yep. All right, next up is Katni. Hello. So let's see. Last week, finished up a new page in the CircuitPython Essentials Guide, which is uh, talks about board import board, uh, dir board, and um, built-in modules in CircuitPython. It's all stuff that we use, but something we never actually explained. Um, so there's a page uh, for that in the CircuitPython Essentials Guide, and it has been mirrored into every single um, CircuitPython compatible board guide that we have because it's very important and these questions come up a lot. Um, if you find a board guide that it didn't get mirrored into, please let me know. Um, I pretty sure I got them all, but uh, they can sneak in. Um, I got some blogging out of the way. We always blog new and updated guides, and I had a whole slew of them um, get kind of backed up. And so I did that. Uh, published the ISO 1540 guide. Um, added a couple of things to the welcome to um, CircuitPython guide, which was... Um, the explanation of CircuitPy file system use and the explanation of what CircuitPython does when your code ends. Um, 
updated the CircuitPython Essentials Audio Out page code for CircuitPython 6x, which just meant taking out some uh, try accepts that were necessary for uh, 5x to 6x um, compatibility. Uh, and now that we have 6x stable, updated that. Um, published the AW9523 guide, except for the CircuitPython page and fix the Feather Sense pinouts page layout to be more readable. And uh, started the data logging page in the getting started with Pico guide. So this week, um, I'm adding a, or continuing the data logging page in the Pico guide. I actually finished that earlier today. Um, and then I'm adding uh, reading a potentiometer um, and PWMing an LED to the getting started with Pico guide. Uh, I'll be updating the MLX30393 guide for the QT rev. Um, there's a couple docs that need to be added to the Feather CAN guide. And I will be starting to train up on uh, taking over temporarily the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter publishing. Um, Anne's going to be out for a bit. And so uh, over the next few weeks, I will be working with her to um, learn the process, and then I will be handling that for the time uh, that she's out. And uh, I wanted to make a note, um, as of 10 minutes ago, uh, we have a new email address. It's cpnews at adafruit.com. And that is the place to send your Python on hardware projects for the newsletter. Um, instead of sending them directly to Anne, you can now send them uh, to this email address, and it goes... Um, it goes to both of us. Uh, so that way we can make sure that everything gets in. Um, and uh, I didn't note in the notes, but for fun, I've been working on um, building a website using a static site generator called Pelican that runs on Python and decided to basically write a theme from scratch. Um, and so I've been working on that. And uh, I guess a belated hug report to Crayola for heading into a um, mire of JavaScript because apparently doing uh, integrated search on a static site is much more difficult than it sounds. Um, so that's been days and days of fighting with JavaScript. And uh, it's been, um, it's, but it's, it's working finally, basically. It's, it's basically done. So I'll be pretty soon pushing that new theme and the new features um, to my site. And that is what I've got um, going on. Awesome, thank you, Kenny. All right, next up we have notes from Jose, who says, last week, base alignment for a display text label, uh, PR for Pico and the example for the Jupyter Notebook, PR for Adafruit CircuitPython DHT, correcting the trigger values. Uh, this week, base alignment for the bitmap label, documentation and read the docs for the bitmap label, and other requests are accepted. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. Uh, thank you, Jose. Um, oh, and that was out. That was out of order, too. Oh, well. Uh, next up is kmatch98. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I guess the prior prior week I had demoed a, a, a rotozoom bitmap copy function in Python. This week, uh, put it into the core. So it worked uh, a lot speedier. Um, then um, I revised the widget and control classes. This is for the GUI elements that are envisioned to work with the new grid layout function for, for managing touch and display uh, on screens. Uh, and then I just put together here, rather than put what's new, maybe it's easier to capture what's out there in the list of widgets that are, that are available. They don't necessarily all conform to those classes but at least uh, there's quite a few things that are that are out there that people can start uh, trying out. Um, maybe not complete or released yet, but at least uh, uh, they're getting developed. Um, and so this week, uh, I want to try out Hugo's new uh, uh, progress bar, or uh, advancements on that. Since I'm kind of new to that, I want to see what that looks like. Um, and then on the, uh, the new widget and control classes for the GUI, I've got a kind of a major, a giant PR there that's draft. I want to pull out just the those main classes and, and get feedback on those to see if those are shaping up to what people think are useful. Uh, and a related note, I want to also figure out how to use the Sphinx documentation tool on my machine so I can see how it actually documents those to see if that's useful, uh, particularly how to deal with all the inheritances of different uh, layers of, of classes. 
the subclasses. Um, as for next, I want to document at least one widget and make sure it is fully compatible with the new grid layout function. I think that'll probably be the, the key goal for most widgets to make sure they resize and get placed well with the grid layout. Uh, and then last, uh, I want to get the, that roto zoom function in the core uh, organized so it'll be useful uh, and, and I guess figure out how folks can build it if they want to add, it, add those bitmap tools into their, their build a circuit Python. And uh, I think Scott envisions that a place for any bitmap manipulation tools. And I already thought of another one to actually do color remapping from copying from one, one bitmap to another. So, so that's up for this week. Okay, thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, KMatch. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, so last week, I continued working on ESP Home for a couple more days, but got stuck on an issue with Wi-Fi and I2C not working at the same time. Like it was disconnecting me from Wi-Fi. Uh, I worked on some GitHub issues and PRs, and I added some uh, bug fixes to some of the Raspberry Pi scripts. Um, I attempted to get an alternative ST7789 driver working on the Raspberry Pi, but uh, I ran into the same issue where it's like not drawing it or whatever. And I started working on a uh, first e-ink guide and a series of e-ink guides. So this week I'm going to finish working on that one, start on the next, and repeat. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> All right. Uh, lastly, we have notes from Microdev, who says, I should take a time code, um, <laughs> who says, update the ESP IDF to 4.3, uh, add NVM support to the RP2040, which I think is almost done, and then the UR is in progress as well. And that's it for status updates. Next up, and finally, we have In the Weeds, which is a chance for us to talk about any sort of longer form discussion that we want to have. Uh, the way this works is you put your notes in the notes doc, uh, kind of your name and then kind of what the topic is. Uh, and we'll just go uh, kind of calling one by one. Uh, if you are lurking, I'll just read it off um, and then answer the question. So first, uh, will I will kick it over to Hugo. And hopefully I will be able to chat without muting myself first. So, I can hear uh, you. Excellent. Um, yeah, what I was thinking is uh, for the pilot run from running them on as part of the CI CD pipeline this week and last week, uh, I started running it manually on my environment, just command line for both the library and the examples. And it seemed to me that it would be a good place to use uh, pre commit as well so that someone's running pre-commit locally, they would get that feedback as well as any other uh, changes from Black or from other mm -hmm. uh, feedback tools. And I believe I heard there was an issue or there was some uncertainty about getting other uh, hooks in there. So I did some digging and found a way to do it. I just, I don't know if it's something that would be worth putting in or not or we want to keep it separate. No, I think I, I think standardizing to stuff that's run by pre-commit is a really good idea. Like, we're already finding that we we need to push more people towards doing pre-commit. So if pre-commit becomes a one-stop shop, that's a good place to be. Um, so I think, I think that's the right way to do it. I see here on the notes that you're a little worried about, like, having to update everything. Uh, but we do have, like... We have ways of doing that. <laughs> like Dylan in particular is like really good at uh, doing like here, we need to change all of our libraries this way. Like Dylan's really good for that. Um, he does a, he does a mix of automated and manual and, and is really good at running everything down. So I would suggest uh, if there's not an issue for it, let's, let's make an issue for it and then we can coordinate there. Uh, like what needs to be done first, which is like the cookie cookie cutter side and then uh, figuring out how to do the like a patch, apply patch sort of thing that the patches all of the repos with it. So start okay. with a PR on cookie cutter though, you think? I think just an issue, an either issue on, on... an issue on cookie cutter or yeah, I think cookie cutter is probably the best spot. Um, 
and yeah, you tend to want to start there because that's that makes all the new libraries up to date with it. Yeah, and it's easy to forget about it once you're in the libraries proper to circle back around to really the starting point. Right. Yes. Yeah, I'll, so I'll open an issue with that and uh, put comments and information in there on what I was, what I've had to do to make it work. Awesome. Yeah, that that sounds perfect. And for those just listening, there's three folks in the chat that all plus one the idea of, of standardizing on pre-commit. So thank you, Hugo, for doing that. No Looking at your uh, gist of the pre-commit, the concern I have, and I raised this because I was burned by trying to add something to pre-commit within CircuitPython, um, is that there don't seem to be commands to install the required version of PyLint. And if you if those tools aren't there, which they won't be in the context of the CI system, or if the version is different, then you can get different results or just get an outright failure. So I think some work will be needed on that pre-commit um, script so that it ensures those are installed, but otherwise it looks like a good start. Okay, is that something that would be worth having in the requirements uh, TXT file? I'm not sure the correct way to install these dependencies for pre-commit. Um, I think, you know, normally when you run it, it creates virtual environments and things. Um, but when you're directly calling the pilot command line program, it's not going to do that. And so this quickly gets beyond my expertise in pre-commit. It's just reminding me of the trouble that I had when in CircuitPython, I wanted to move the uh, make check translate check into pre-commit and it led to problems that I wasn't able to resolve. So just something to be aware of, but I, I don't actually know what the fix is. Okay. I, I appreciate that. I'll bear that in mind and uh, see if that comes to be a problem, how to go about resolving it. Yeah. I think, I think Python usually has the notion of like development requirements as well. Like I think there is actually like a dev dash requirements.txt that is used occasionally. So that it's possible that there's like a second way to specify requirements that are only for development. Okay. I've made note of that because I'm sure I'll do that. Okay. Um, as a side note, uh, it's worth noting that um, pre-commit requires an actual revision number. It's something we have to update across all the libraries. Um, so using latest and stable is not supported. Um, I, you're not doing that in the pilot section, um, and I, you must have copied the initial section from uh, one of the non-updated libraries, but I just wanted to make a note of that um, for anybody who's working with pre-commit. You have to you have to give a revision number. You have to choose it and pin it right. and deal with that and then deal with updating it as time goes. Okay, I will do that. Awesome, thank you. All right, I'm going to move on. Uh, next up, we just have a question from Jose. So Jose asks, just wondering if there's a long-term plan speaking to implement I squared C peripheral for the Pico, or even if this would be possible. And I would say it's possible. I, I believe that the peripheral can do it. It's not high on my list uh, because, frankly, I'm a bit overwhelmed by all the other stuff people want. Um, so... I don't expect myself to get to it before I want to get onto something else. Uh, but if you'd like to take a crack at it, that would be awesome. Um, I think it is doable. It's just like, it's a relatively new module for us and I don't think a whole lot of people use it. Um, so I, I'm hoping somebody else will do it is the, is this the, the short of it. And uh, Jose is typing, so I'm just going to, wait to see what their response before we move on. Yeah, so looking at the SAMD implementations, I think, are the only ones we have there. Um, that's where where I would start. And it, I, of course, if you have questions, Jose said, thanks, I will see the M4 implementation. Yeah, so if you have any questions about modifying the core of CircuitPython, this goes for anybody. If you ever want to get into it, but you're you're struggling with something or have any questions, like, I promise you, I will take the time to walk you through it. I'm, 
it is in my best interest and it's in all of our best interest to get more people working in the core. So if you've ever wanted to do that, uh, but needs some help getting over a hurdle or two, please reach out. Um, we'd love to get more folks working in the core. Um, okay. With that, let's go on to the next one. Next up, I think, is from Jerry. It's Jerry. Well, the other end is Zero Mover SPI, and and there's a library that supports the that, and um, it works with the uh, Bluefoot SPI friend as a as a breakout board as well. And and I was just curious, you know. A while ago, we talked about one thing that people have asked for a couple of times is why don't we support the UART Bluefoot friend? Mm -hmm. And and I think it's it's not a big change or big you know it wouldn't be too hard to add it. But my question is 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 there any interest in in continuing to support that library um, or are you really looking to deprecate it and 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 ignore it given that BLAO is so much you know more usable? I think I think generally I think Adafruit's generally approach Adafruit isn't Adafruit. to stop supporting something. I think we generally will keep it working, but we won't necessarily add anything more to it. Um, so if it's interesting for you to add UART, like I think if it was added, we'd be okay fixing it. Um, but you're right. Like if people want to do Bluetooth, we would point them to an NRF, a native NRF option. Okay, it just comes up from time to time because people try and use this thing. And there, there's one, there's not really a great guide out for it. There's a good example for how to use that, mm -hmm. that library. But uh, all right, well, I'll play with it because there, there are a couple of bugs that were found in it and issues that have been open for three years mm -hmm. <laughs> on, on, on that library. So, um, but um, I, I guess I'll take a look and just and, and see. So there's no objection to it being added or updated, but no, no real push for either right you like right. i think the place we would start is we would have to start by not selling it right and we still do you do st still do sell them that's that and that was my point on yeah okay okay yeah i i think generally like just saying the sam d21s are in this boat too like we're not really adding anything more um yeah you know and i i think yeah i think support long-term support for the M0 Bluefruit is is pretty limited just because of its limited usefulness. Um, right. I, I could play around a little bit, I suppose, with trying to play with the with the build for it to see if you know if it could be made more usable. But I, that wasn't the focus. It was really more for the two breakout boards, the, uh, mm -hmm. the UART and the SPI breakout. Right. Whether those are useful tools to be used with with some of the other processors or not, or there isn't because there is no. No, if you have an an M4, a SAMD51, there's is there a, a useful way to add Bluetooth to that? Well, Dan added the ESP32 coprocessor. That's so. through, you can do it now through the through the uh, Nina. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right, so maybe it really that that really is a much better solution. Um, I think uh, certainly okay. it's a better it's a better solution from us from a like support standpoint because the okay. we're oh. like we're speaking HCI commands across yeah no, um, that, that yeah which that, is that, that that's yeah it makes a lot more sense is that i don't even know like with the blue fruit friend is that possible like maybe that's the best way to go about it is actually changing the software on the blue fruit friend to be hca yeah hmm. but we'd have to, it's it's a lot of work to revamp the firmware and if there are only half a dozen people in the, a year who right. are who ask about this it's totally not worth it <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. All right. Just thought I'd check in on it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jay. All right. Next up is Deshipu. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. So, uh, as I, I as I mentioned, I, I'm trying to focus a little bit more on games for Circuit Python, and uh, right now I'm trying to make a game where you have uh, when you are walking around a screen. And one, one problem I have is that uh, you need to rearrange the order of the sprites, mm -hmm. the order of drawing sprites, uh, pretty much dynamically every time you, you change the uh, position of the sprite. And uh, you don't care 
generally i i noticed that uh, with with the uh, order of drawing things in a group don't very much care about what position in that group exactly the item has you more uh, care about whether it's uh, in front of or behind something else that you care about so i i want to work on the display io.group to, to make the interface a little bit uh, useful, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing I would like to do is this sorting thing, but maybe also later. I don't know, uh, maybe it's a move behind, move in front of something like that uh, methods on, on, on it. And uh, yeah, of course, I would like to ask uh, uh, what people think are would be the best approach to sorting it because uh, generally i i can imagine three three approaches right now uh, already we can we can sort a group by just removing all items from it sorting them in a list and adding adding them back to the group one by one in the sorted order but uh, obviously that's not very efficient and if you want to do it every frame then then probably are going to run into trouble. The group is uh, bigger. Uh, next next thing is to simply add a sort method to, to the group uh, using the same code, reusing the same code as on the list possibly. And then you would just uh, call the sort method uh, on it on every frame, uh, which possibly well, the, the Python sort is pretty efficient, but uh, with partial, partially sorted things, maybe not, not the best. And the last option I can think of is to have like a sorted group that would automatically keep things sorted by using something like a priority queue, maybe something like that. And uh, would basically sort things every time uh, something is added or change it. Mm -hmm. uh, in that group. and uh, then you don't have to worry when it's sorted if it's sorted uh, basically it would use the dirty flags that are already there mm -hmm. to do that so i i don't i don't know which which one i mean either all of them work for me except maybe for that pure python approach uh, which might be too slow and uh, yeah, I would like to ask about opinions on that. I mean, I, I, I think the core challenge is that there are M0 boards that have this class built in. So adding anything to them is going to be a struggle. Yeah, we, we could have an additional class. Like right. We, have fancy, we could have fancy group. Right, exactly. Yeah, just like the, just like the bitmap stuff. I, I think that's one option. The other the thing that I think would get us much further is simply, you know, to use list internally in, in group. Like the only reason, yeah, yeah. like a lot of people, was... sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I was thinking about uh, basically reusing as much of list as we can. To, to... It's also like jarring for me that the, interface of the of the group is uh, completely different well completely different it's a very small subset of the interface of the list right and that's yeah, lists would be great right and like people think? people regularly run into the like size the fixed size limitation and things like that so i think if i were to do work on group i think that's probably what i would do is i would figure out either how to be a subclass of list or have a, a list internally that then people could access. Um, but that would need to be like a two-way connection if you want to sort it at least. Right, you would have, what do you mean two-way connection? Well, if, if you have an, uh, like give me a list from this group you you would also need a, a, a method that they take this list and make a group out of it well no, not not thing. if not if you're actually giving the like internal list object back oh right right because okay. you then you could mutate it in place 
Yeah, yeah. That's the, that's um, Jeff E. asks, is there concern about the time to sort or the dirty rectangle that results from it? Yeah, I think that's you know that's something we would have to consider as well as like, if you're doing a sort every frame, making sure that you don't dirty like the whole bounds of the group uh, if things do not change sort with respect to each other. Um, yeah, of course. If you, oh, well, but I, I think group already handles that. If you change anything in the group, it becomes dirty. Right? It usually propagates down to its... Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. It takes the bounce. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm open yeah, anyway. I, I'm I, I'm open to it and you know the constraints uh, which is like it's still got to fit on the Halloween build for M0. Like um but if I were to personally do the work I would probably get us away from the like try to be a list but not really be a list. So, so basically uh Basically, there are two options. First is to uh, the the desired, the more desired one is to just use the list or somehow wrap the list in, inside. Right. Uh, I will try that first, and uh, if that doesn't work, then maybe the fancy group yep. in a separate. Yep. Uh, mod maybe that. Bitmap tools could be renamed to graphics tools or something like that. I, I would keep them separate. I would keep them separate. Oh, I... um, lots of small modules is always better, I think. <laughs> right. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, unless there's like one API that would make it easier, like a swap or something. Otherwise, I would. I, I, it's fine having a module that has secret access to under the hood stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, one more uh, here. So let me just read it off. Um, David Glad asks, is uh, github.com slash Ghidra Ninja slash PIO disassemble, a PIO dis disassembler any way useful for the PIO assembler library uh, to try to make sure it's complete and gives the right result? Uh, how many PIO assembler syntax exist and is the canonical syntax? Uh, what features are we missing in current PIO assembler library? Um, so this is all for those of you who don't know about the Pico and the RP2040. PIO is a special peripheral on it, and it has its own uh, assembly language. It is helpful um, if we did want to start writing tests of being able to like go to and from text and back, text and bytes and back. Uh, I don't have plans on adding it. Um, there is not really a canonical syntax because if you read the data sheet, they're like, oh, commas are optional, um, which means that I originally implemented it without commas. Jeff added comma support. Uh, most of the examples have commas. Um, is there a canonical syntax? I don't think so. There's. So the last question is what features are missing? So the actual PIO ASM can do like variables and basic expressions. Um, so you could say like define foo as one and then later in, in some places use foo plus two or something, um, which is not supported by the CircuitPython uh, PIO ASM version. Um, the Proper PIO ASM allows you to do like inline C code, which I think is kind of absurd, but um, that's the way that they handle. Like, there's this is something that we're we're having to figure out in PIO as well of like how do you declare all of the setup that happens before your code runs, and there's like no canonical way of doing that in PIO ASM. It's just kind of like oh, we just put inline C that does all this stuff for us, or we put these ma magic declarations for MicroPython that gets converted into the MicroPython code. Like, there's no unified way of defining stuff like that, um, which is what I've been thinking about on the CircuitPython API side. But um, I think in terms of the actual ASM, like in terms of the actual instructions, um, I think it's basically complete. It's the it's the metadata around PIO that the PIO ASM library for CircuitPython doesn't doesn't handle like 
like wrap targets. Like if you're not wrapping, like CircuitPython will always wrap around the whole program. It won't, in PIO ASM, there's ways of designating that you want to wrap in different different places as well. So I, you know, my approach to, to new things is always to try to like get at the essence of what is interesting and what people you use and only add this stuff as people rely, demonstrate how things should be used. Um, so with the I2S stuff for PIO, like we're finding things that uh, we need. So like, um, like I'm doing reading and read and write at the same time, but that was kind of just happenstance. But like Jeff had this problem and a number of the other people have had the problem of like getting the pin state to be what you expect it to be by default. And so I think that's one thing I just, I just want to do this week to, to make it easier, which is like, if you have output pins, they will default to being output unless you override this keyword arg that makes it not. If you have set pins, they'll default to output, except if you override it, like just like having some, some logical defaults that people are already assuming around the initial state state of things is, is something that I, I think I'm just going to tackle by making more keyword args on the PIO state machine class. Um, keyword args, they can, like, if you've ever looked at like the e-ink display stuff, like it can get kind of wordy in the docs, but I think keyword args are a great solution on the code side because you only add the ones that you want to be non-default. So it, so on the code side, the code side, is, I think, is clear. It's just like the APIs can get a little hairy if you are if you have like 20 keyword args that you can put into a class constructor. It's, it's a little weird. But, um, so yeah, I, th- I, I saw the, the disassembler thing go by and the, that's certainly helpful for like making sure that you're, the code that we generate, the, the bytes we generate with PIO ASM represents what we think it represents. Um, and I was thinking about writing a disassembler myself for that reason, but uh, it's also the other thing is that like PIO ASM is only nine instructions depending on how you're counting, so it's not a whole lot to understand, and programs can only be up to thirty-two instructions, so there's not like a ton of instructions to look at either. Um, so it is doable to just like go one by one and make sure that it's correct. So. Um, that's one thing to consider as well is like, you don't necessarily need a ton of tooling for a program that's only ever 32 instructions long. Um, and in practice, like most things are done in just like four to 10 instead. Yeah. I mean, if you want to use it for unit testing and regression stuff, that would be awesome. It's just like, I literally wrote that library in like a day (laughs) just to get it going. Um, so that's, that's something that will come with as, as it matures. So just to clarify, Scott, you would be happy to see somebody begin writing unit tests for PIO ASM. I would love to see that. <laughs> yes. And that 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 is broadly true for all of the code that I ever write. <laughs> like the thing with unit testing is that like it getting the framework set up is often for me the hardest part. Um and so if anybody wants to get us over that hurdle for just about everything, like the other thing I would love to see us do is actually C-level unit tests in CircuitPython core. But like, I don't know how to set that up. Um, but when it comes to like adding unit tests, it actually can be easier because you can just copy existing tests. Um, so I, yeah, it's a lot of activation energy for me to add that initial, first initial test. Um, so yeah, it would be good. And like, this is something I've feared since like CircuitPython became a thing of like, at some point we're going to get so big that like the lack of tests is going to really bite us. Um, and I still think that's true. So, so it's, it's a good intuition. Awesome. Well, uh, <laughs> too big to test Well, we were tiny when we started, um, Okay, let's let's wrap this up. Uh, 
Thank you, everybody, for joining this CircuitPython Weekly for February 16th, 2021. Uh, as always, if you want to support CircuitPython development, uh, it's open source, so we'd love to have you contribute. But also, uh, you can support uh, those paid of us paid by Adafruit to work on it by going to adafruit.com and purchasing some hardware there. Uh, the video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services after that. It literally takes the, the audio out of the YouTube video. Um, this will also be in next week's Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. You can go to adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that. Uh, the next meeting will be held on Monday, so not like today, which is Tuesday, but next week is Monday. Um, so be aware of that at uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern on the Adafruit Discord server, uh, which you can join by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. Uh, if you would like to speak uh, in the meeting uh, or be notified about the meeting, uh, please ask to be added to the CircuitPythonnisa's role. You'll get a, your username will turn purple, and that's uh, one way to ch check that you have it. And... Uh, with that, we'll see you on Monday and see you on the discords before then. Thank you to everybody who took the time out of their day and take the time every week to join this meeting. It's uh, always puts me in a good mood to hear all of the awesome stuff. So thank you. And we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Scott. And have a yell. Thanks, Austin. Awesome. Later.